Inspector Gadget here in Egypt, with my colossal friends, Ramses, Ramses, and Ramses. Sounds like an Egyptian law firm. I wonder why they all have the same name. Oh, they're all statues of the same person, Egyptian Pharaoh Ramses II. Let's investigate some of Ramses' fellow pharaohs, including King Tut and Queen Cleopatra. Go, go, Gadget Field Trip! Egypt is in the northeastern corner of Africa, tucked between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Egypt is mostly dry and barren desert, so most Egyptians live along the banks of the Nile, the longest river in the world. Around 3100 BC, the small kingdoms along the Nile were formed into one big kingdom under the first of Egypt's 31 dynasties. What is a dynasty, you ask? A dynasty is a long line of rulers from the same family. Egypt flourished under dynasties for about 3,000 years until it was eventually conquered by Rome in 30 BC. Located just outside Egypt's capital city of Cairo, the pyramids of Giza are the tallest monuments ever created to honor Egypt's royalty. The Great Pyramid was built around 2600 BC as a tomb for the pharaoh Khufu. Wowzers, no wonder they call this pyramid great. It's as tall as a 40-story building. It covers 13 acres and is made of 2.5 million blocks of limestone. Looks like we'll be taking the stairs. My keen detective sense tells me that King Khufu is still buried somewhere inside this pyramid. Let's investigate. Aha! This looks like the burial chamber. But where's King Khufu? It says here in my gadget guidebook to Giza that the pyramids were looted by bandits who stole the treasures and mummies hidden inside. About 400 miles south of Cairo lies the Valley of the Kings. Many pharaohs were buried here, including the one and only King Tutankhamun. His pharaonic friends called him King Tut. My keen sense of detection tells me Tut's tomb is around here somewhere. Maybe you can help me find it. Go, go, Gadget Copter! Aha! Just as I suspected. Touch two. But where's his pyramid? Would you believe his mummy had it moved? Would you believe his daddy? How about my Uncle Gadget Sphinx? By about 1800 BC, pyramids went out of style. However, a new kind of royal burial ground was devised. The newer tombs were chiseled right into the side of a mountain here in the Valley of the King. Inside these tombs, you can walk deep inside magical halls covered with hieroglyphs. 
This was an ancient form of writing which used pictures to represent words and sounds. Wowzers! Once upon a time, this was the eternal resting place of King Ramses IV. Like Giza, most of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings were looted by treasure hunters. So, what did the fourth Ramses have in common with Tutankhamun? They were both buried here. But Tut's treasures have been taken far away to the city of Cairo. Let's explore. Let's go, go to Cairo's Egyptian Antiquities Museum. Wowzers! Mummies and coffins and cats. Oh, my! Looks like the Tut treasures just barely outnumber the Tut tourists. Wowzers! Duck must have cost King Tut a pyramid of pennies. King Tutankhamun was actually only nine or ten years old when he became ruler of Egypt. And here's his boy sized throne chair to prove it. When Tut was only about 18 or 19 years old, he died of unknown causes. His body was mummified and a spectacular golden death mask was placed over his head and shoulders. Tut's golden coffin was placed in a larger coffin called a sarcophagus, and then in a larger one. Tut and his treasures were buried in the Valley of the Kings, safely hidden from the tomb bandits for over 3,000 years. Then in 1922, a group of explorers broke through a concealed entrance and were stunned to uncover the extraordinary riches of King Tut's tomb. And now an Inspector Gadget field trip fact. Ancient Egyptians believed in life after death. Therefore, along with a the mummy, ancient Egyptians buried favorite earthly gadgets. Belongings like toy boats, jewelry, and mummified pets to keep them company in their next life. Unfortunately, mummified pets don't make the greatest company. They can't speak, but they do know how to play dead. Welcome back as we frolic with the pharaohs on our field trip through ancient Egypt. We were just talking about the ancient Egyptians' belief in the afterlife. I wonder if they used aftershave in their afterlife. Boy. I know one pharaoh who sure could have used a good shave. And this bearded pharaoh was no boy. It was Queen Hatshepsut. And if you say her name quick enough, it kind of sounds like hot chicken soup. At least that's the nickname the locals have given her. Near the Valley of the Kings, Queen Hatshepsut built herself an enormous temple. Of course, she had a little help. The temple had massive columns and stone guards. The guards helped keep out the other queen wannabes, like queen beef barley soup and queen sweet and sour cabbage soup. But what's with that silly beard? Let's go go up those ramps and check it out. A fake beard was a symbol of kingship and was worn by both male and female pharaohs during special occasions. During her reign, Queen Hatshepsut was a pretty popular pharaoh. Her Egyptian high school class even voted her most likely to lead. At last, we come to Egypt's final pharaoh, whose life reads like an ancient Egyptian soap opera. If you guessed Queen Cleopatra, you're right. During Cleopatra's reign as pharaoh of Egypt, the Romans repeatedly tried to take her land. But instead of fighting the Romans, Cleopatra flirted with them. By becoming the girlfriend of Roman leader Julius Caesar, Cleopatra successfully kept parts of Egypt under her rule. In 44 BC, Julius Caesar was killed, and Mark Antony took control of part of the Roman Empire. So Cleopatra conveniently became Mark Antony's girlfriend. When Mark Antony died, Cleopatra finally re
realize that her lipstick diplomacy probably wasn't going to save Egypt from the Roman Empire. So, at the age of 39, Cleopatra ended her own life, possibly, by a venomous bite from a cobra, the very symbol of Egyptian royalty. Talk about biting the hand that feeds you. I hope you had a good time on our field trip through Egypt, peeking at the pyramids, chewing around the tombs, and clowning around with Cleopatra. Until next time, go, go, gadget field trip. Inspector Gadget here on my latest top secret assignment to explore the third largest country in the world, China. Would you believe that nearly one out of every five people on Earth is Chinese? That's amazing. A new baby is born here in China about every two seconds. Grab your chopsticks and hop on your bicycle. It's time to explore one of the world's oldest living civilizations, China. The Chinese call their country Zhongwa, or middle country probably because the ancients believed China was the center of the world. No, no, gadget, whoa! Actually, China is in East Asia. It's so big that if you head east, you can't miss it. It shares borders with 14 other countries, including Russia to the north and India to the south. The capital of China is Beijing. Today, the center of Chinese life is in Beijing. And in Beijing, it's hip to be square. That is if you're Tiananmen Square. At about 100 acres, Tiananmen Square is the largest public square in the world. It's so big that corners don't even know each other. Each day in Tiananmen Square, the crowds gather to watch the guards raise the Chinese flag. Gee. Those guys don't miss a beat. They step in perfect time. When the flag finally goes up, the Chinese national anthem rings out across the square. This colorful Chinese bird is made of paper, and you don't have to feed it. It is believed that the Chinese invented the kite. They've been flying them for centuries. Tiananmen Square is surrounded by monuments and museums that honor the people of China. The square is named after the Tiananmen, or Gate of Heavenly Peace, that sits at the north boundary. Wowzers! Look at that picture of the chief. Actually, it's a chairman. Chairman Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong founded the People's Republic of China in 1949. Mao believed that communism, or common ownership of property, would help make China stronger. Chairman Mao is no longer alive, but communism in China still lives today. Before communism, powerful families known as dynasties ruled the land. 24 emperors and their courts called this imperial palace their home, and the public was strictly forbidden. The penalty for trespassing was death. Some barbarians took the risk, but getting in wasn't easy. First, you had to be a great swimmer. The palace moat is about 50 yards wide. Then you had to be a mountain climber to scale these 35-foot-high walls. They should have just used a go-go gadget neck. And you thought those daring barbarians were sticking their necks out. Wowzers! Inside the walls are nearly 250 acres of palaces, courtyards, and gardens. Of course, there is an easier way to get in. The main entrance to the palace is here at the Wu Men or Meridian Gate, which stands 125 feet tall. That way, dragons don't have to duck their heads. 
The Wu Men Gate is also known as the Gate of the Five Phoenixes because of the five pavilions at its base. The security at the palace was so strict that once these gates were closed each night at sunset, even the emperor himself could not open them. Time for a fascinating field trip back. The Chinese built their buildings with curved roofs to keep away evil spirits. They believed that spirits traveled in straight lines so the curves would naturally confuse them. When we return, we'll go inside the gates of the Forbidden City. Welcome back to our field trip through China and the Forbidden City. Inside the Wumen Gate is the first of many courtyards. Since the emperors were considered sons of heaven, they brought harmony to the earth by laying out the city symmetrically. Important buildings face south called the provider of all blessings, the sun. Plus that way, the emperors could lay out and work on their camps. Here we cross the bridge of the Golden Water, a river that runs through the Forbidden City. The Gate of Supreme Harmony leads to the city's inner sanctum and is guarded by two bronze lions. On the left is the female with her paw on her baby cub and on the right side is the male. Dragons can be seen all over the Forbidden City. The Chinese believe they protected the palace and brought good fortune. I'll stick with my lucky rabbit's point. Through the gate is another courtyard that holds up to 90,000 people in case the emperor was in the mood for a lot of company. Facing the courtyard is the Hall of Supreme Harmony, where the Emperor sat for special occasions. For non-special occasions, he just went to his room. There are three flights of stairs that lead to the hall. Coincidentally, they also lead away from the hall. The middle one features a ramp carved out of white marble that only the Emperor could pass over. He didn't walk, of course. He was carried into the hall in his palanquin. Kind of like a royal sedan chair. Must have saved a fortune on royal jogging shoes. Inside the hall are many treasures, including 18 bronze incense burners and a nine dragon screen. In all, there are six main palaces and lots of other smaller buildings in the city, containing over nine thousand rooms. Wow! Did you know that a six-year-old boy named Pu Yi was the last emperor of China? That's about the same age as this emperor wannabe. Except he looks a little too friendly to rule a billion people. Cole Hill or Jin Sun Park is a man-made peak made from the dirt dug out of the palace moat, which tells me it was pretty muddy up there at first. Hundreds of stairs lead to the top of what was once a private imperial garden. Coal Hill is a great place for views of Beijing. Wowzers, barbarians are trying to push down the city walls. Go, go, gadget binoculars. Actually, these women are practicing Qigong, an ancient meditative exercise that helps strengthen different parts of the body. These women look like they're practicing to swim the moat, but it's just another form of exercise to unite the mind and body. This is called Tai Chi Chuan. The practice of Tai Chi, or shadow boxing, is based on the martial arts and is close to 1,000 years old. What's feeling good without looking your best? In the morning, outdoor barbers will give you a haircut and shave right on the street. A free rinse is included if it rains. After their morning exercise, the Chinese often visit one of Beijing's many street markets to buy fresh vegetables and produce. But don't buy too much. More often than not, you'll only have a bicycle to carry the groceries home. 
the Chinese average less than one car for every 500 people, which is a tight squeeze even for short trips to the marketplace. So the main means of local transportation is the bicycle. In fact, there are more bicycles in Beijing than people. Riding a bicycle through Beijing is one of the best ways to explore the city. Here, riders park their bikes to watch a Chinese man teach a foreigner the art of taking opera. One of the instruments used in the opera is called the Jinghu. It sounds like a scratchy violin. Wow, it's time to gallop out of here. I hope you enjoyed our forbidden field trip through China. We flapped the flag in Tiananmen Square, scaled the walls of the Imperial Palace, dropped in on the 9,000 rooms of emperors, hung out on Coal Hill, and peddled with the people. Until next time, go, go, gadget, field trip.